Welcome, Meat Smiths. You're listening to a Meat Smith Harvest. Restoring husbandry to prosperity. By means of the traditions of our fathers. This Farmstead Meat Smith production is made possible by you. If you like it, please consider supporting our team by going to patreon.com backslash meatsmith and donating at a level you'd enjoy giving at. Your gift helps us increase the quality and quantity of all our free media education. Thank you, and happy harvesting. How are you this afternoon, Brandon? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> uh, it's a mix between... Hi, and how are you? Yeah. Hi, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> buckaroo. Uh, good. I still love that quote. That is so good. What? Uh, oh. Restoring husbandry to prosperity. Mm-hmm. It applies. That's William Cobbett. Oh, right. That guy. Yeah. He was, we keep coming back to him. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had slated to talk more about him today but i think we're already in over our head content wise so okay <laughs> we'll talk about well what i was going to bring up was his book a history of the protestant reformation in england and ireland mm-hmm. which actually has a lot to do with the agrarian uh consequences yeah uh, of yeah it, it really affected that country's culture it did and the agriculture. Yeah, there's a very technical link. Yeah. That we continue to suffer from as a result yeah. of being divorced from the liturgical calendar. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, maybe we can talk more about it too. William Cobbett yeah. is always our man. Mm-hmm. Um, but before we do, I wanted to mention a couple of things. You are going to be in Fort Scott, Kansas. Mm hmm. On February 25th and 26th at a conference called the Prairie Troubadour and it's got a really great slate of thinkers that will be there yeah um, kind of so philosophers literature guys there's gonna be a, a, a sub prior from the Clear mm-hmm. Creek Abbey and yeah all much more qualified than i am to talk about <laughs> you're the food guy <laughs> anything yeah that's really great in fact the, the email thread you were tossing around was like well just have some bellies there for me and i'll <laughs> i will uh make something happen yeah, yeah it's gonna be fun because there's mm-hmm. a lot of really great people there um bacon from yeah. acorns blogger yes um is going to be there. Yeah. Um, a sub prior from the Clear Creek Abbey. Yeah. Um, Dr. Cutterback, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sir, Dr. Who's John professor. Cutterback. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, a philosopher from Baylor University, I think. And many other great thinkers. Yeah. So. It's very Catholic. It, it's, yeah, it's it Catholic is. Catholic conference. There's a really neat Catholic thing happening in the Midwest. You know, we've kind of skirted around it, but it might be kind of fun to bring up why that is. Oh, do we know? Meaning John Sr. Oh, yeah. I was going to talk more about these books, but I think I'm going to wait till I actually review them. Yeah. But that was his first one, The Death of Christian Culture. And then, so you don't get too despairing, he wrote The Restoration of Christian Culture. But he began the, what's the institute in University of Kansas? Uh, uh, of Integrated Humanities. That's right. And it was very much a classics program as far as I understand. Uh, but extraordinarily fruitful. Yeah. Lots of vocations and amazing things sprung therefrom. Right. And... Um, yeah, he was at the University of Kansas, and it's there's the Prairie Troubadour. I think is even at least uh, indirectly the fruit of that, and even you know lots of schools and uh, monastery. Even. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, very influential. Yeah, 
John, Dr. John Sr. It sort of looms in the background um, mm-hmm. behind a lot of the Midwest cultural re- restoration of culture mm-hmm. type movements that mm-hmm. are happening. So yeah. anyway, so you're going to be at this conference. Yeah. Uh, oh, what, what's the name of the conference? The Prairie Troubadour. Well, that's the name. Yeah, I get what's the name of this particular uh, annual oh. conference. Yes. It's a really good name. It's an annual conference that happens regularly. And it's called Feasts, Feasts, Fasts, and the Seasons. Right. So this is the sixth annual symposium. February the 25th and the 26th. They call it the Art of Liturgical Living. So uh, it has the Ghent altarpiece on the website, which I yeah. really love um, because it shows a lamb. Mm hmm. Uh, that looks as if it is slain in the center. Yeah. Bleeding into a chalice. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> that, that should be every Slaughterman's favorite painting. Yeah. It's just, it's so good. Yeah. So um, there's a really good lineup of a handful of guys going to be there. Mm-hmm. I wish I could go, but we will be having a baby weeks afterward. Mm-hmm. So I need to stay home. And... Um, yeah, it's it's gonna be. They talk about all things cultural revival, um, faith and reason, mm-hmm. science, um, agriculture and poetry. Yes, all yeah. kinds. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that would be fun if you're in the area to to go on over there. PrairieTroubadour dot org is mm-hmm. the place to look up that information. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about is our membership. Yeah. So it's a brand new year, and we've slightly altered very slightly altered the description of the membership the membership is in its fifth year wow which is crazy to think about Mm -hmm. 2000 what is that 2017 i think is when we launched it in the summer so we're coming in on fifth um five years Mm -hmm. and there's just a lot there i keep you know i'm i ignore it for quite a while and then i look back like twice a year and I'm like whoa there's a lot there (laughs) um but anyway I just wanted to really quick go over because we keep talking about classes here Mm -hmm. um the the classes for this spring are have capped they're full so I really want to make sure people have a access to our content though and right now the membership's the best place to be yeah so there's basically like five pillars of the membership right now and the first one is the private community facebook page and it's a great place it's, it's one of the best parts of the whole membership yeah. it's where members post their real-time experiences meet mm-hmm. some thing questions to you successes some failures but all learning experiences yeah And a lot of times there's pictures and videos. Yeah. From husbandry to harvesting to curing to cooking. Mm -hmm. All of the animals. Yeah. (laughs) And it's it's wonderful. Um, We we tend to uh, stay on topic. You know, there's not a whole lot of side Mm. stuff going on, which is helpful. And then the other great thing that the Facebook page does is you can be listening to these podcasts real time. Right. So whereas... If you're not on, it takes at least two to three to four weeks to get it out. The podcast. So, yeah. yeah. But so. we, we stream it live on the Meatsmith Table Facebook group and take questions and comments from yeah. Meatsmith members mm-hmm. as they come. Mm-hmm. Um, another pillar is the forum. So one of the amazing things that we've done with the forum that we've done regularly semi-regularly is we've taken the things from the Facebook page Mm -hmm. and we've categorized them into the forum. So there's been great content for five years on Facebook, but who wants to scroll through all that? Yeah. It gets buried in the stream. Yeah. So we, we, we go back like every six to 12 months, um, Victoria does, and she captures some of the best that you've written or Mm -hmm. maybe that some other people have written. And then it gets sort of, archived in the forum yeah so that's becoming quite a big resource in and of itself um 
the, we also have a resource library. So that has all of the archived live chats that you've done, mm -hmm. which is just you and the computer talking and answering questions. Yeah, from the members. Dozens of questions sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so like, and that is our main way of of real-time engagement with people. Mm -hmm. So if you have a question, like for Brandon, about something you're going to do in a month, Brandon's going to be on the internet once a month mm -hmm. to answer that question before you need to harvest your animals. So, um, And then also in the resource library, we have all 10 of our butcher salt e-chapters, which uh, people have benefited from. Yeah, tools, lists, and... Mm -hmm. How to slaughter a pig, how to clean intestines. You know, it's kind of, uh, there's a lot in there. Mm -hmm. And Joel Salatin even endorsed those too. Oh, yeah. Way back in the day. We should use that. <laughs> it's on the website. Is it? Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> okay. The, the, oh, and also the last thing in the resource library is to kill a pig nicely. The, I, would, I would call it the director's cut. <laughs> so on YouTube, it's there for free, but it, kind of speeds right through the actual killing because mm -hmm. YouTube would censor it otherwise. So yeah. I'm surprised they haven't actually. Um, but the 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 one that's inside of membership is it slows that down. Yeah, it's not edited or yeah. redacted for YouTubery. Yeah. Which some of our videos are getting um, censored by YouTube. Yeah. Because they dare to show people how to harvest their own animals in a humane way. And it's a tricky thing to keep up with. Because I, I know there's a degree of strikes. And once we get past that, something happens. We get punished yeah. somehow. <laughs> so I know. It's it, just starting to happen. Yeah. So we need to, at some point, rethink how long we want to be on YouTube. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah. As long as it's the easiest thing for everybody to access. I know is the best yeah uh, place so far I uh, know I know we'll see yeah the the meets with table is and the whole membership is unique in that it's geared towards an assertion of delight in the domestic scale it's all about home slaughter home butchery home curing at the home for the home mm -hmm. by the home yeah. um so, which is not what you get in most printed materials or classes you might take even at an extension office or university. They tend to adopt as the norm the rules and conventions of large-scale processing, mm -hmm. large-scale, which doesn't really fit in the domestic economy. Mm -hmm. It's so cool because what that means is we attract the best, the coolest people. It's <laughs> they, true. They are, they're small farmers all over the country and uh, globally even, uh, all over the world. And they are doing things, they're doing all the cool things. They're doing everything small scale. Um, and they are, I mean, we even have like one of the three small-scale foie gras farms on our membership and I don't know it, I've it's I was starting to go down that path and trying to integrate for understand the fattening of palmipedes of migratory waterfowl in the context of the home from which it originated so extracting it from the tormented process of an industrial scale uh, which I generally regard as the source of all evil in the culinary and agricultural realm. So I thought, there's got to be a way to do this that is holistic, mm -hmm. that is domestic, and that is ordered, mm -hmm. and does not involve the tormenting of birds and the destruction of their nature. Because when you do that with any livestock, that, that doesn't work on the home scale. That is the luxury 
of mass production. That's the luxury of steel and concrete and huge, powerful machines. Those are tools that enable you to do things that are contrary to the nature of an animal. But when you don't have those, as a mere necessity on the home scale, you have to cooperate with their nature. Anyway, I wanted to see what that looked like for fattening ducks and geese because mm -hmm. um, there is, to me, foie gras is, it, it evinces this thrift that's on another level. It's another level of thriftiness. And it transcends um, mere, merely not wasting something. It actually takes that which is generally regarded as waste, the offal, mm -hmm. the liver, which is, it's kind of small, you know, on a duck. or, And so it's, it's usually that which is cast aside. But you actually take that thing and you turn it into the most extravagant, beautiful, worthy of a feast, you know, uh, mm -hmm. culinary delight that you can imagine, mm -hmm. which is what foie gras is, all while working with and not against the nature of the animal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I actually think that the, the, the proper context for that is the backyard is is the home mm -hmm. kitchen mm -hmm. anyway <laughs> someone does that yeah <laughs> <laughs> and they're on the meat smith membership which yeah. is so cool yeah so all of the the technical elements of like how do you do gavage in a way that is kind that's more like milking a cow mm -hmm. every day or shearing a sheep mm -hmm. all extractive things that we do with our livestock that are beyond their wild um, you know habits. Uh, how do you do that with a with a duck? Yeah, on and a domestic on a domestic domestication. Scale, yeah, and it level. can be done. Yeah. So, um, which is really cool. Yeah, that's uh, exciting. Yeah. You were saying our members are doing cool stuff. Yes. So yeah, yeah and like super cool. Yeah. And we, they are the <laughs> they're the cream of the crop. Like yeah. they're you know we have people that are running pigs in Arkansas on mountains. Yeah. And with very little inputs, and they're exploring the the nature of pigs as uh, family units rather than mobs, mm -hmm. low resolution mobs of prey animals. They are family units, and so there's it's just really cool. Um, and again, all oriented to the domestic scale. We need to start interviewing our members. I know, <sighs> and get okay. them on this podcast. I know. So we can. We're really close. Um, we're just, we can barely handle the tech of this. I know. It's... But we are, I mean, honestly, we've been trying for like two years to figure out how to get the tech yeah. to work, to we're just... have our members on yeah. that are doing yeah. amazing things because I have hours and hours of conversations that yeah. I could have with them. Mm -hmm. be so, we could have with them. It'd be so great. Uh, so we should so just... We'll, we're going to figure it yeah. out. In order to do that, <laughs> we have to move to the city where people just get internet. Crazy good like internet. Crazy good internet. But then we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. Yeah. So I mean, this is the conundrum. We can give ourselves a break. We just moved. <laughs> so But we just had the internet guy out this morning. This morning. I know. So but see, we're working. <laughs> we're doing it. And all right, he all right. did help things a little bit. <laughs> so we just need to have him out again to Yeah. Uh, it's it's all our upload speed, I think. But I know. Stuff is okay, so okay, we'll get in there. Okay, let's move on. So the last two pillars of our membership, we have a bank of over 20 Harvest Journals that you wrote yeah. way back the first few years you were doing this. Mm -hmm. Those are excellent in and of themselves. Oh, really you. good writing. Anecdotal, philosoph philosophical, just great. We also have a bank of near nearly 50 demonstrational Harvest Journal films. I would say maybe half of which you, maybe not quite half, but... A good third, probably, you edited yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and those are all, like, the visual components of yeah. what we've been talking about. So, like, I've been looking every once in a while on YouTube or Instagram, and we get people's questions. Yeah. And they're all, like, the basic standard questions. Mm -hmm. They're the good questions, mm -hmm. the really good intro. Like, how do I... What temperature do I scald a chicken at? Yeah. Kind of questions. And you're like, Ugh! like... 
we have that. It's in membership. <laughs> and I could just type in 145 degrees really quickly right now. It's so tempting. But like then we kind of actually limit the information because it's not being fully developed. Because mm-hmm. there's much more you could say about how to scald a chicken. So you can, I, you can write paragraphs and films about it. I happen right. to know. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, if you have one of those really awesome questions, it's all in membership. Yeah. In various forms. Incidentally, this is why, just by sheer necessity, I I never respond to comments on our right. YouTube page. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of great questions there, yeah. and they're yeah. they're constantly, you know, being added more and more and more. But it's uh, I the reason we started the membership is so that I could afford to just put my energies towards answering member questions mm-hmm. because I I can't keep up. Yeah. With. Uh, yeah. With just, you know, the stuff that's on YouTube. Yeah. Those comments. Yeah. And speaking of not keeping up, so we decided that one of the, the big changes that we're not adding monthly films anymore. That was something we were trying to do. We would have had to raise the price in order to keep that up because mm-hmm. the editing was just taking so long. So at this point, in order to keep the membership price the same, which mm-hmm. is a pretty good price, I'd have to say. Mm-hmm. Um We've we've just kind of locked the bank up, and it is what it is. And then every month, you are on Facebook Live Chat to keep answering questions and keep keep things fresh. Yeah, well, but, and we're still going to make Harvest Films. Yeah, absolutely. I actually have two in the, oh whatever it's called, okay. funnel, channel. <laughs> uh, yeah. Dugout, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, they're on, I just, <laughs> it takes, because I film them yeah. and demonstrate with them and grow the livestock for them and then i edit them so it takes as a one-man show it takes a while so those are coming yeah we'll get them out kind of sporadically Mm -hmm. but anyway so that's membership sign up it's Mm -hmm. a great year to do this lots of people have signed up in the last um 12 to 24 months um with things happening in the world the way they are and you want to hunker down and learn how to provide for your own home needs this is a key tool to being able to do that. It's also the good life. Yeah. It's really nice. Absolutely. You won't want to go back. Yeah. So speaking of the good life, we have been talking a lot about natural law, the family farm, mm-hmm. um, just all the from a conceptual level. Yeah. Like our experience, the experience of some of our members that mm-hmm. we've been t- in touch with and how family farming is going to save the world. So pretty much, <laughs> um, I just wanted to, I think, and I think we struck a chord with people, some people that mm-hmm. gave us good feedback that they really loved that mm-hmm. and they wanted more. So I, I was thinking, and at the same time in the last couple of years, we have got a good handful of books that have been helping us along in representing from kind of an academic level, not just academic though, but a philosophical level, why this is too. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of thought we could do some book reviews maybe in the next few recordings that we do. Um, but just to kind of help us springboard into mm-hmm. um, wherever we want to go. There's so many thoughts. So yeah. the one book that I kind of thought we could start with, or I guess rather the author, mm-hmm. is uh, Father Fahey. Mm-hmm. And he wrote this book, all right, The Church and Farming. And then actually he wrote a lot of books, but these are the two that we have been able to review. Mm-hmm. The Rulers of Russia and the Russian Farmers. <clears throat> and I have to say, we came across these books about a year, maybe a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. They're from um, Loretto Publications. So first of all, Loretto Publications is a really good place for kind of niche, like a, like Catholic bents on mm-hmm. farming mm-hmm. Um, or just all things culture. But Father Fahey has a number of books that if you like what we've been talking about, he says it way better. (laughs) (laughs) But what he does, like for instance, 
In the church and farming, he gives you the philosophical breakdown Mm -hmm. of modernity and how we got into the trouble we are in now. Mm -hmm. And, but he also like kind of reads towards the middle of the book, the last half of the book, like nourishing traditions. Yeah. Because he talks about bread processing, flour processing, and phytic acid, and... Yeah, he totally Sally Fallon. Yes. um, Like, one of the chapters is... But before, when was... Was this the 30s? Yeah. This one is great. Cartesian philosophy in action. Artificial manures. (laughs) So he talks about soil health. Yeah. And it, it's all, it's not just ivory tower stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like, this is, this is how it, it fell apart on the ground. Mm-hmm. And then eventually he gets to how it all fell apart with education. And then, um, and the fa- the decay of the family farm. Anyway, I'll get into all of that. But, yeah. but I'm just saying at the beginning, it's, it connects philosophy to real life problems yeah. and then of course he doesn't leave you hanging like the solution is very simple mm-hmm. yeah. and obvious and spiritual the hunt is up. The hunt how many people do you know you would say truly share your back to the land values or your passion for home scale craft meat curing or simply love the multifaceted beauty of a good meal as obsessively as you do maybe a handful at farmsteadmeatsmith.com we've created an online community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world and a platform for them to learn from and inspire one another. In addition to our major semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Pacific Northwest homestead, over at farmsteadmeetsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources years deep now for you to dive deeper into your food journey with. And both our classes and online program include access to our private community Facebook page for your continued education and fellowship. We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeetsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you, putting the knife in your hand, article by article, and comment thread by comment thread, and can support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. Should we just start on the philosophy of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that was just an overview of the book, but I thought... The best way to begin anything, as uh, Marianne von Trapp slash Julie Andrews <laughs> says, is to go back to the very beginning. <coughs> and he starts with Thomas. Mm, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas. So, Thomas teaches us that there is a close collaboration between our sense faculties and our intelligence in the acquisition of intellectual knowledge. On the presentation of sense data... I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that that actually that first sentence is uh, the that is the the philosophical solution to all. The yeah. Problems. No, I know. Yeah. Oh, okay. I should have just stopped there. <laughs> I, it's just the paragraph was so good. I have a hard time stopping. But okay, pray continue. Yeah. Well, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Okay. So our sense faculties and our intelligence. Yeah. Go ahead. Sense faculties, meaning just the, the powers of the senses. Yeah. Um, you know, all these things on our head and stuff. Mm-hmm. And that they, all knowledge comes to the brain, to the intellect, which is a power of the soul mm-hmm. through the body, through the senses. Yeah. And that doesn't sound that revolutionary. It kind of sounds, uh, you know, well, duh. But... Um, like, of course, all, all we can know is, is from what comes through our senses. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's actually, that is ex- exactly the thing that uh, modern culture keeps trying to throw off with its different kinds of epistemologies mm-hmm. that are really nefarious. And you're probably going to mention nominalism and all that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the, um, 
the basic we operate on the assumption that that is true all the time like every second yeah and no less so than in farming yeah more so because it means that you can actually know your creatures yeah you can actually know the order you can actually perceive how they act and how that's an indicative of their family of their group of their the habits of their species um and how it affects your soil, your land, your the, mm-hmm. the productiveness of your pastures. Um, you can actually know that stuff by through your senses. Mm-hmm. So you can actually know the nature of pigs by observing them. Yeah. And I know that that's, uh, that's huge. That is huge. Because yeah. we tend to flee directly to more... Knowledge that has a different appearance. So statistical knowledge, knowledge that appears mathematical, knowledge that um, comes to us in words that have uh, the suffix logi at the end. Anything that is a logi tends to uh, have lots of legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually if you you are totally equipped by your senses to understand your creatures Mm -hmm. your animals Mm -hmm. um and that is i feel like that's that is the that's that is the ground upon which our entire business farmstead meatsmith has grown and provided anything unique to anybody Mm -hmm. about anything Mm -hmm. because from the beginning by i don't know providence or whatever by accident, I just knew that all of the authoritarian, the authoritative, sorry, author, well, sometimes authoritarian, the authoritative sounding knowledge, the sounds authoritative, um, mm. that is actually just a spin. Mm. That That is the fruit of a centralized system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from the beginning I've been very confident and able to just say actually my senses are telling me that that's not actually the thing Mm -hmm. that that is actually probably exactly wrong yeah given the context of a domestic scale which is much smaller yeah and you know that goes through the way I've looked at making salami or curing meat or um, yeah the way you regard raising pigs you realize that there is so much diversity uh, so much variability in the natural world that has two characteristics. One, it cannot be simplified by a top-down centralized approach. Um, and two, you are the best equipped to understand it mm-hmm. because you're standing right there in that situation in real time. Yeah. And uh, that nugget, like that, that is because we make this assumption We have this trust of our senses that we can actually receive knowledge. Knowledge comes through them. Mm -hmm. And you can see that that is exactly what is attacked, at least by highfalutin modern philosophies. Either that uh, you can't know the outside world through your senses, either because it doesn't exist, it's all in your head. Mm -hmm. Um, Or... The very fact that you're observing it alters it so much that uh, it's not itself anymore and you only perceive your own perception of it Uh, and that's that's also a Mm -hmm. non-starter that's crippling Mm -hmm. anyway it makes you search for highly authoritative modes of knowledge yeah that can only have the appearance so i just i love that little nugget of thomistic philosophy all knowledge comes through the senses that is that undoes the whole tapestry of um, abdicating your intellect to other sources, mm-hmm. to authoritarians or um, academics or whatever. Yeah, I mean, inherent in that is, like as you said, trust. That we can trust. The world has been ordered in such a way it's not cruel. Mm-hmm. It's not tricking us. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we can trust what we are seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, and hearing. And like when you smell 
bacon <laughs> that's gone off, that's telling you something. You're going to know. And you don't have to read it in a book to know. Mm-hmm. It's like we've been educated so much out of our common sense. Yeah. Yes, and I would say that we actually have some work to do to gain it back. Absolutely. It's not just enough to say, well, I reject all the conventional wisdom on X topic. Mm -hmm. No, you can't do that. You actually have to re-educate your senses Mm -hmm. because ultimately perceiving reality as it is or perceiving the nature of a pig or the relative flavor profile of prosciutto or the spoilage possible uh, in salami or Uh something, all of that... It, uh, those are habits uh-huh. that we, we still have to work to acquire. Yeah. We don't just acquire them by chucking the conventional wisdom. Yeah. You, you actually have to work at it yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But it's all, you're not working against your nature or against the nature of reality. Mm-hmm. You're working with it because mm-hmm. you are actually part of reality. That's right. As opposed uh, to a disembodied mind hovering above the primordial soup of material yeah. world. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, yeah. that was really abstract, but I no, just I yeah. love that that particular nugget because it's borne out over and over again. There's it gives you hope that there's no just how much you can learn by observing things, by mm-hmm. looking, by watching closely and paying attention. And as a slaughterman, a mobile slaughterman, I had the advantage uh, in that I was motivated to do that by necessity. Mm-hmm. Like you have to watch the habit of the sheep herd that you're there to slaughter a few lambs from if the day's going to go smoothly at all. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's this need. You're like, okay, I need to understand this grouping thing that they're doing. Who's the leader? How do I keep the calm and keep the peace? Because this is directly related to my well-being, yeah. the well-being of the herd. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's amazing the subtlety that you notice in the nature of things, yeah. especially mammals that we partner with to yeah. survive yeah i mean and this is there's nothing sort of supernatural or spiritual that you've said yet mm-hmm. this is merely observing nature and trusting to a certain extent our own yeah. senses um well isn't that even aristotle i mean that's older than i want to i want to say it, it has all to be, knowledge comes through the I have senses to check but i know yeah. yeah i mean that just seems like basic but it is this nugget that for us has become a key to unlocking so many things and because we're like in this exodus moment in our lives of like recognizing how modernity has affected every part of life um it's become revolutionary even though it's so simple (laughs) yeah it's like like yeah. our three-year-old operates on this assumption. Very effectively. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she gets her emotions evolved too much, but That's like right. she sees and hears certain things and it's real mm-hmm. to her. And you can know, a part of this too is that you can know the nature, I guess you've already said this, yeah. but that you can know the nature of something based on what you're seeing from it. Yeah. Um, and so and then the, kind of building on this, you can know, you can apprehend directly the natures of objects with their consequent interrelations. So mm-hmm. how we can our your like my nature interacts mm-hmm. with your nature, and by reasoning through the analogy of being. Mm-hmm. So, just to clarify, there are mainly two ways that we as humans learn something, mm-hmm. and one of them is through analogy of being, mm-hmm. and that's like if I say. I'm like the moon Mm -hmm. and you're like the sun, Mm -hmm. you know, and we can extrapolate things that help us learn more about Mm -hmm. the feminine and masculine nature. Mm -hmm. That's just an example. But that's what analogy of being means. When we learn things by analogy. Yeah. So by looking at a flock of sheep or a ham that's rotting, (laughs) or (laughs) we can actually detect things about our nature too. Mm Mm-hmm. Because by our observations. So this is why it's important. So by reasoning through the analogy of being, it can ascend to God who completely transcends the world. So God is outside of nature, mm-hmm. but he's given us nature to learn by mm-hmm. our own natures, how much we need him, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. So at that point, you do get into the theological level. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But many, I just wanted to mention that because many of our viewers are there already, and it that's just that's just a beautiful yeah uh, motivation mm -hmm. to pay attention with yeah. your senses all the things yeah, and that is I think that's the assumption if if you can see that there is a natural law that there is an order to the way the world works uh, and all of the creatures on it. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, there is an there is an intent mm -hmm. that law is expressive of an intent mm -hmm. and so while it's not a you know it's not something that it is the natural law is something you can perceive mm -hmm. and observe uh, completely with your own powers of observation it's there and it's clear uh, it's not divorced from an end mm -hmm. because everything is ordered to an end mm -hmm. and that's uh that's what you find the closer you look at the natural order yeah. of things. Yeah. Because it has a telos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a good segue because uh, we kind of lost that mm -hmm. part of philosophy. So, and you were starting to say also, or you were saying at one point that there's there can be a couple of manifestations of um, losing contact with... Mm -hmm the natural world through your senses mm -hmm. and he so he so he takes this basic truth mm -hmm. that all knowledge comes to the intellect mm -hmm. through the senses and he says where we got off the rails mm. and that this moment in philosophy is where we where it, it trickles down into what we're seeing now yeah so we've seen that for St. Thomas, there is close collaboration between sense and intellect in the acquisition of our intellectual knowledge. This harmonious functioning of the two sets of faculties of the one being, man, gave place to the Occamist system, referring mm -hmm. to William of Occam, to a simple extrinsic coordination of sense and intellect. So a simple extrinsic coordination of sense and intellect. So they're not separate anymore. Mm -hmm. According to Occam, the two faculties, sense and intellect, have the same formal object, the individual. Hmm. Of course, he affirms that the sense faculties are material and that the intellect is immaterial. But since they both have the same object, the individual, one of the two becomes superfluous. Hmm. In the course of time, modern philosophy, which is entirely nominalist, which we can talk about mm -hmm. what that means, in its attitude to the objective value of the natures grasped by our intelligence in the data of sense and the reasoning based thereon, proceeds to sacrifice one of the two faculties. Mm. According to the faculty sacrificed, we have the two currents of nominalism into which modern philosophy is divided. Wow, yeah. So the individual... It's sort of like we mush yeah. the sense and intellectual faculties into one or the other, but mm -hmm. it's still, it's not, it's sort of like grace builds on nature. Yeah. So we need the sense faculties, but we don't just like rely on them. Mm -hmm. We have, we use our mind too, to interpret yeah. the sense data yeah. that we're, that we're getting. Mm -hmm. So, um, and ultimately, the intellect, right, is on a higher order mm -hmm. than, like, the lower bodily mm -hmm. faculties. So, anyway, so Descartes, for instance, his famous cogito ergo sum, mm -hmm. he doesn't trust the body right. anymore. So, you, all you get is, I, mm -hmm. I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And so... He sacrifices the sense data. Yeah, right. And then Locke does the opposite. Uh, uh -huh. He relies only on the sense data. Yeah. But he kind of eliminates in very him and Hume and some of the other yeah. guys. They eliminate this object yeah. of the intellect. Right. And then we all we have is materialism. Yeah.
that's part of uh, <laughs> we see that plight now. Anyone that has even like a tiny little bit of philosophical education, like if you read a little bit of Aristotle, Plato, it's shocking how you'll see empiricists or you know scientists today, certain scientists, okay, most of them, they make very basic philosophical errors, mm -hmm. like super fundamental, mm -hmm. basic. Yeah. And number one among them is uh, that utter reliance on material sense data. Uh, regarding that as the only thing that is real and forgetting that there there is an intellect that has to interpret that data for it to even exist, mm -hmm. um, for it to even be collated or uh, ordered at all. And they kind of forget. It's like, and so they, they assume to themselves the object, the authority that objectivity confers. And they just say, no, this is the way it is. Look, I did a study. <laughs> Here's the numbers. Here's the objective fact. Uh -huh. And it's like, bro, you interpreted a few things. Mm -hmm. Like you gotta, and just the fact that they ignore uh, the interpretation, how mm -hmm. it might be affected, uh, affect the data mm -hmm. is like, that's just, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a non-starter. That's mm -hmm. a no-go. And it seems to be pretty pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, <clears throat> that's it's just remarkable to me. Yeah. So, um, but I would, I would see that as that overemphasis on the, the empirical, the, the sense data. Yeah. That's the only thing that is. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that is a constant pendulum between that yeah. and then uh, ex extreme withdrawal from the material world, from your senses and from your own body mm -hmm. um, into abstraction. Yeah. I mean, and you can see almost where they become two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. in certain ways because at the end of the day, it's still about the individual. Yeah. Depending on if you lean too far on the materialist side or just the egotistical, yeah, my reality is what I want it to be, mm -hmm. and I'll use whatever science I want to do have right to justify yeah. it. Yeah, so the physical realm is and nature itself is totally malleable to my intellectual formation. Mm -hmm. I can make it what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. That's the other side of the empiricist mm -hmm. thing, right? Yeah, and we're just constantly in a pendulum between those two. Yeah. And he's saying that's because we've mushed yeah. the scent powers of the senses and that, the intellect. Yeah. So. And I, I would need to kind of dive a little deeper to understand that mushing mm -hmm. <laughs> a little more technically. That's just my quick little mm -hmm. review. But um, yeah, it's, it's not keeping categories in their proper place. Yeah. So sense... And intellect mm -hmm. and I think it comes down to um, subverting you know your senses your your feelings sometimes over and above your intellect yeah like so sense is very necessary but it's not what mm. we ultimately trust mm -hmm. we have to use our intellect mm -hmm. to process what our senses are giving us yeah so like emotions aren't wrong but we have to be able to give a scent to them is it proper to cry at this moment is it proper to get angry at this moment mm -hmm. and maybe i'm subject um conflating conflating feelings and sensory mm -hmm. i'm just sort of putting them on the same level but well they're both physical that's what i'm getting at yeah, yeah. whereas but, intellect is spiritual because it's mm -hmm. part of the soul mm -hmm. And yeah. he, he does go further to define between mind and Thomas does. Mm -hmm. So there's a physical aspect as well as a spiritual aspect of the intellect. Yes. Right. So memory and imagination are more of the physical, physical. aspects. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of what the spiritual aspects are. But um, yeah. anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so that mushing, mm -hmm. it would be good to define that better. Yeah. Yeah. It actually... It it's tricky when you're stuck in one of those paradigms, those extremes, they are extremes, you know, the, the rigid positivist, like, 
um, empiricism or the voluntarist like assertion of your idea of things to completely alter mm-hmm. uh, the world around you as you want it to be. Um, those make you very vulnerable mm. because they untether you from what is actually real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so all that has to be done is knowledge has to be presented to you in a way that you perceive as legitimate. Mm-hmm. And then you're, you're taken. Mm-hmm. Like it, ha- it either has to be presented to you in a, um, you know, a, a mathematical form. And I'm not saying math is not real, but uh, it's, you know, it has to take the form that validates your, pre- your, your pre-existing prejudice for empirical knowledge Mm -hmm. void of any notion of subjective interpretation Mm -hmm. or presented to you in a in a form of um the noble assertion of will over anything else to shape things to your idea and if it's presented to you in those ways then you can be controlled you can be led to do anything Mm -hmm. um which is uh Neither safe nor wise. Yeah. Uh, but the and, and it's not fun. It's not fun. Yeah. Because they usually both operate on fear. But the if you actually can trust your senses, mm-hmm. and then you have an intellect that isn't clouded by emotional mm-hmm. regard of things, then you can actually interpret the data that you're getting. Yeah. And then you can cure prosciutto, and it's really delicious. Like there's really not. Yeah. That's the way. Yeah. That's the step it takes. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it always ends at prosciutto. I know. Um, but. <laughs> yeah. And there's, I feel like there's, there's a cool, um, there's a really neat movement right now that we talked about a little bit last time where we are seeing the importance of a tradition in the animal kingdom to use an archaic phrase, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, because the archaic stuff still tends to work. Um, And there is actually tradition there, even. And that's one of the ways uh, wherein you can can see this phenomena, and you can perceive it with your senses, and it's real, and it's legit. And it is the multi-generational... Uh, understanding of livestock Mm, mm -hmm. which is a big thing and it has direct and for those of you who really like the empiricist positivist form of knowledge direct testable observable Mm -hmm. um, on what animals eat Mm -hmm. so you can even isolate you know a uh, a parent animal and the one I read was on in uh, Frank Provenza's book on rabbits and you, she can eat a thing, a certain plant like juniper, mm-hmm. and even and then her kits will be able to eat that. Mm. And it sounds very basic, uh, but the if if you present kits that have never who, whose mother had not eaten juniper with juniper, they don't eat it so much. Mm. They're not into it. Mm. They they didn't receive whatever that was from their mom to understand or to some bodily way know that you can eat juniper, which is real important for rabbits that live in high altitudes um, where only conifer type junipery plants grow. So um, that's generational knowledge and that has direct effect on how you might think about raising livestock. Mm-hmm. And the same goes for, you know, I've talked about it with goats before, too. You can see it directly. There is the queen mother goat that kind of picks what we're going to eat today. And everyone follows her. Hmm. She knows what to eat. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that to keep the composting bin in her gut going well. Hmm. And by extension, everyone else in the herd. And they are all following her example. And her offspring will have that kind of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And you lose it when you remove her from her, or her offspring from their place, and you put them in a new place. Um, okay. Because they're unfamiliar, they don't have that received knowledge or tradition, whatever it is, mm-hmm. that the mom had. Mm-hmm. And so, which tends to be the way we raise livestock. We raise them all, um, you know, 
from the farrowing pen or calving pen, like they are immediately torn away from the parent animal and put in a totally foreign context. And how much efficiency and good management are we losing when we do that? Mm -hmm. How much knowledge mm -hmm. is just being ripped away? Mm -hmm. And how much could be gained if you retain that basic unit, mm -hmm. which, is, which is not a herd, it's a family. Mm -hmm. For a couple generations and you you will start to actually see benefits on your land mm -hmm. so there is this um, that's just more the flowering of the nature understanding the nature of the creature the more you observe it rather than trying to volitionally you know through the strength of your will impose a nature upon them that they that they don't have and mm -hmm. extract from them what you want and what you deem valuable mm -hmm. in spite of the objective characteristics of their physicality mm -hmm. um, to take the, the voluntarist route. Mm -hmm. Or um, I guess it tends to be the same. You can regard them as merely physical objects that are extractive, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, of protein. Yeah. You know, or yeah. whatsoever it may be. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the same extremes in yeah. my mind. Yeah. And yeah, because you can see that in ge genetics. You can see these double muscled bulls online that are terrifying. They, <laughs> not in the sense of they're scary, threatening animals, but they, they look like mutants. Mm. And it's gross. Oh. It's clearly not natural. Mm. And that's because we want massive amounts. Of lean beef yeah because um, yeah. that's what we want yeah and so we're gonna actually change the cow yeah. uh, to meet that and I'm not against like n you know selective breeding and everything uh, because in the right. end I think the telos is of these domesticated creatures is a whole nother topic to actually partner with us sure on a domestic level mm -hmm. so certainly we would do that but you can always tell when there's an excess mm -hmm. and it's like oh we are changing this breed of cow into a lean meat producing machine because we have an excessive disordered appetite for bland, fatless protein. And that is wrong. And, and that will make money. Right, yeah. Like ultimately, yeah. he talks about that, that we've changed so many things. We've uh, changed a cow. Yeah. In order to accommodate not families anymore, not our own guts, not our yeah. own needs on the domestic scale, yeah. but through money manipulation. And he talks about how mm -hmm. Locke kind of gave way to this. Oh, yeah. That the Locke version of nominalism uh -huh. gave way to a change in the economy. And so and you, you, as you're reading this, you're just seeing point by point. And examples everywhere, mm -hmm. like you just said, we're changing beef mm -hmm. to accommodate the bottom line, mm -hmm. rather than what will actually feed. We yeah. say feed the planet, but right. we just we really just mean. Oh yeah, that's one of the most pernicious. Yeah. Ideological lines. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're just looking at who's getting more money out of mm -hmm. this, and ground beef. A certain kind of ground beef is mm -hmm. what makes money. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of cow we got to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have, on the other hand, the Cartesian version. So, and this is another example. So he devotes a special chapter to the question of fertilizers mm -hmm. because the arguments for their employment are a striking example of the Cartesian attitude that there is nothing in bodies but quantity and local movement. Mm. So you have like the negation of our physicality. So it doesn't matter what we eat because mm -hmm. we're just pure mind anyway. So yeah, eat all the Doritos you want, mm -hmm. you know, which is wrong too. Mm -hmm. But it's like this, there's just different motivations at work. Yeah. So, but I just think it's so great that he points out just like you did, these examples that we're seeing all over the place of the natural world around us just crumbling mm -hmm. and we're like scratching our heads why why mm -hmm. did this happen it's because we got away from thomas mm -hmm. and we started just naming our own reality mm -hmm. in different ways and and uh and he takes like the natural world 
is then just a springboard for some of these more global problems yeah. that we're seeing now, like money, mm. money systems, mm-hmm. and education and healthcare. Like he talks about state medical, mm-hmm. you know, structures, and then honestly, a centralized control over mm-hmm. everything. So he starts really particular, yeah, and then he goes really universal and global, mm-hmm. and you're like. Oh, I see it all. It's all <laughs> unraveling before me because we have gone nominalist. And mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah, it's the strict luxury of urbanization again. I feel like that's just this where one location where we can create artificial reality for ourselves. And that allows us to indulge in fantasies about what is real. Yeah. Because you just don't have that luxury yeah. in when you're living on a farm Mm -hmm. things are just too real (laughs) and Mm -hmm. so urbanization is a a tricky effect of that i Mm -hmm. think thank you again meat smiths for listening to this podcast and our take on all things meat making householding and culture keeping we hope it's helped you grow your home around the harvest This conversation will be continued in a forthcoming part two episode. Thanks for listening and peace be with you.